I'm done. I want out. It's just money. 1637, 1797, 1801, 29, 1937, 1974, 1987. Jesus, didn't that fuck up me up good? So for decades in New York, we've had this thing called the pizza principle, which essentially says that the price of a subway ticket is the same price as a slice of pizza. But this balance was broken this year for the first time in decades. And of course, the problem doesn't relate specifically to pizza. It's just about everything that's going on in the world. Global chaos, inflation, looming financial crisis, cryptos rose and fell. It promised millions of dollars and then collapsed. It took people's futures with it. Startups are closing down, people are losing their jobs, and expensive pizza is really the least of our problem. It's just money. But the question in all of this, the question that I think that we have to ask ourselves more often is, who is to blame for all of this? Shouldn't we have seen this crisis coming? I want to explore how we got here in today's very special extended episode of Company Friends. Welcome to our select greenhouse in Brooklyn. Whatever our overseas team needs to work out in New York, this is where they'll stay. We rented this apartment a couple years back so that it there'd be a place that feels like home. But rent on this place went up by $800 this year, over 30% increase. And that brings me to the beginning of today's story because there was a point in time where you could buy an entire house with this. We're going back to Holland or the Netherlands in the 1700s. The Dutch were powerful. There was this company that essentially ruled the seas. They had, they had a private army for themselves. The East India Trading Company. Now there's one crucial cultural context that you need to understand about the Dutch. Most of the population back then were Calvinists. That was, that's one of the strictest forms of Protestant religion. Now Calvinism forbids them from parading around, from showing any luxury or from even wearing any fancy clothes. So get this, you're a 1700s entrepreneur, you have a startup, you have trading spices, you live comfortably, you're making money, you need your profit chairs, you visit your occasional coffee shop. But how can you brag about this newfound social status in a religious approved way? Well, the answer is tulips. I mean, tulips are pretty, but in 18th century Holland, this was the symbol of luxury that didn't break any rules. You could put them on hats and dresses, or you could just carry them around, honestly. Tulips got so expensive that one meant that you were rich and owning many implied that you were somehow filthy rich. And people even started valuing special or defective tulips the same way they do like coins today. Like the ones with color stripes that are caused by a virus were extra, extra special. And tulip prices went up and up and up. But so far, things were still normal until these guys stepped in. Now the thing with tulips is that they only bloom for a short season in the spring. Everybody was getting better at growing tulips, but you could still only get tulips in the spring. So what our stockbroker bros did was come up with this sort of contract, a contract that you could buy any time in the year, and that it would guarantee that come spring, you could get your tulips at a preset price. Now this was of course great because not only are you guaranteed to have your own looks for the summer, you have this paper, you have a paper that guarantees your tulips at a fixed price. And well, this means that if people start getting really excited about tulips this year, or maybe they sacked some other Caribbean town and they have some extra gold lying around, you can now sell your tulip more expensive. Better yet, you could sell your contract for a better price. You didn't even have to wait for the tulip. Now this contract that we're talking about, this is called a future. And yes, we still use futures to this very day. And at some point, tulip futures were truly more expensive than a house, some reached 5,000 guilders when a yearly salary back then was 250. And what a lot of people don't get is that this boom was not created by the flowers. It was created by the speculators. I don't expect anybody to ever have actually physically traded a tulip for a house. Like the madness that happened was over these contracts, over the speculation, over the brokers. But what people really wanted was the flowers not the papers, not the speculation. So in no time, these contracts, these futures that they had come up with had 
no buyers. Chaos, prices plummeting, suicides and lawsuits. No, of course not. That's a very common misconception, actually. As historians researched more and more into this story, they actually found no evidence to suggest that this tulip bubble ever rattled the nation in this way. There's not even a single record of individuals filing for bankruptcies around this tulip bubble. Now, some people did lose a lot of money, but the country didn't even enter into a default. I mean, the Dutch didn't do it very well after that, so it wasn't a success story for the Dutch, but it wasn't because of the tulips. Anyway, the urban legend of sorts happens because we, we sort of love saying I told you so. We sort of love to be the smartest person in the room. We want to brag about that insight that we know that nobody else has. But who was really to blame in this situation? The bro that invented the future? or the people that wanted some quick bucks, or the religion that banned other luxury items. Hold that thought for a second. Let's get into the next story. The greatest crash in the history of the New York Stock Exchange and market prices. The 1920s were crazy times in the States. I wanna paint this picture to you. So the Great War is over. The US has come out victorious and post-war economic booms are not rare. If you're a farmer, you're suddenly maximizing productions to feed all these soldiers that just came back home. Henry Ford had just mechanized the Model T and people wanted their cars and their houses and their latest technology, whatever that was. That means that demand for wood and rubber and steel was growing. It's estimated that the US economy doubled in size from 1920 to 1929. And that's all great, but there's a very big catch. Fast growth usually means having to borrow money. Now, borrowing money is not necessarily bad. Farmers, for example, took out mortgages so that they could pay for more equipment and for more land. Factories expanded and they hired people to ramp up production and they might have borrowed some money to do that. Even regular folks used credit to buy this new technology. So the entire US economy had doubled but it had done so using credit. And the US was printing money like crazy at this time just to keep up with all of this activity. With so much money, so much money lying around, people suddenly wanted to start investing in the stock market. This is regular people, but the stock market was growing really fast. It had reached historical heights and people were confident that it would never drop. I couldn't believe what was going on in those days. So how did this crash become so bad? Well, it's because of banks. <laughs> Banks here saw an opportunity. They saw an opportunity to profit from this new and thriving stock market. Now, what they would do is loan money so people would use that money to invest in the stock market. And when money ran out, when banks ran out of money, they just borrowed more money from other banks or other institutions. Loans on top of loans, all of this money going to bet on the stock market. Now, this little creative instrument is called margin trading. That's when you borrow money. You borrow money to gamble, I mean, to invest, to invest in something. Uh, let me just give you an example. Let's say that you wanna buy some Tesla stock because you're sure that this stock is gonna go to the moon. Now, you've got $10,000 that you'd like to invest in Tesla shares. And for example, at the end of 2021, that would have been about nine Tesla shares at $1,100 each. Now, that's very cool and all, but that's not too many shares. I mean, it's just nine. If your shares gain, say, $100 per share, you've made $900, 10%, that's cool. But the guy next door, he's making a lot more money than you. You want more money because you're sure the Tesla stock is gonna go up. So these stock brokers can help you fund this bet <laughs> with margin trading. And all you need is 10% collateral. So if you show that you have $10,000 in your trading account, what they'll do is they'll lend you the other $90,000. And that way you can invest a total of $100,000 in Tesla stocks. Mind you, it's not that you're gonna invest $10,000 of Tesla stocks. You will own the full $100,000 of Tesla stock thanks to this little loan. Now you have 90 Tesla shares, and then you can go and brag to your friends who are also trading. Now this is called a leveraged trade or a leveraged position. Now fast forward a few months and then Tesla stock drops as it actually did. And now each share is worth $639. Now your 90 shares are now worth $57,000. You've lost $43,000. But remember, you only had 10,000 to begin with. You actually now owe your broker bros $33,000 and they don't really care about the stock price anymore. They care about this loan that they gave you that you agreed to take and you 
bet in the wrong company. This is called a margin call, and it's gonna be really, really important in just a second. Leveraged or margin trading is very dangerous. Today, it's accessible to everybody, truly, with just a click. But even back in 29, it was pretty easy to do margin trading, and nobody likes to think about these bad scenarios. Everybody just wants more. And then these guys know it. <laughs> From 22 to 29, the Dow Jones increased by 220% and at its peak, it reached 381 points in September of that year. People would invest in companies and more people decided to bet on companies with money that of course they didn't have. And then some would say that it's almost obvious that this makes no sense. Again, nobody likes to think about these things. People hate to think about these bad things happening. So they always underestimate their likelihood. But at some point, somebody realizes that the price of the stock versus what this represents, a piece of a company, the price of that stock doesn't really make sense because if you look at the actual company, well, the company's not that big. I mean, it needs to be twice as big to justify the value of the stock today. Nobody likes to think about these scenarios, but sometimes, sometimes they just hit you in the face. People panic, people sell in mass. So company values began tanking the stock market started freaking out and the world was moments away from chaos. But that's not all. There's another element to this perfect storm. Now, I don't want to dig too deep into this whole interest rate part, but you need to understand some basics. The Fed, which is in the US, the central bank, defines the base interest rate from which all banks and lenders operate. So the 1920s Fed was not at all happy with all of this margin investment and all of this spending. It might lead to inflation. So in order to control the spending, what they can do is spike interest rates. That means immediately means that borrowing money is going to be more expensive. It might also mean that the loan that you already took now pays a little bit more interest. Now, it also means that if you put your money in the bank, maybe they'll pay you more interest just for having the money in sitting there on your account. So people are now encouraged to just go with the safe bank account or a certificate of deposit rather than just betting money on the stock market. If you're interested in getting a better return on your money, passive income and cash flow, tax benefits that could reduce your taxable income and inflation protection all while building a legacy of wealth you can leave to your heirs then you need to get this free guide on the single most important alternative investment to diversify your retirement income all you need to do is click the link in the description or type in the url you see on the screen to learn more so other countries also raised their rates to just keep up with the US. And overall, people borrowed less and spent less. And all of these companies, all of these companies ramping production to keep up with all of this demand, now they have things that they can't sell anymore. And lo and behold, the perfect storm. Companies started firing people and cutting wages to keep up with all of these losses, things that they can't sell. So people didn't have the money to pay all those debts that they got. One person defaulted and then another and then another and then another. So started this little chaos, this little house of cards. As soon as the bell rang on a new trading day, this collective panic sparked a sell-off. Crowds started gathering outside the stock market and they were watching as this valley was plummeting. And in this very terrible week, this man jumped to his death. Someone fell out of a window. We're not really sure if it was because they were like committing suicide because their shares were down. But the point is one man died and everybody just decided to panic even more because people now are jumping up buildings because the stock market is crashing. The point is brokers started doing margin calls. <laughs> Remember those? They came back to haunt people. And there was one very big problem. The problem was that these were regular people. These were average, individuals, retail investors with no more money. The brokers demanded such large sums that it was just impossible for people to pay. People tried desperately to sell what they had to pay off these margin calls, but you can't sell a car or a house. It's impossible to do that in a short term, especially if everything is crashing at the same time. So now it's October 29th. This is Black Tuesday. The stock market doors open with just one word, which is sell but nobody was there to buy. Stocks were now worthless. People rioted inside the stock exchange and outside on the streets. Entire fortunes disappeared. The stock market dropped 23% in just two days and there was nothing you could do to stop it. On Black Tuesday alone, 
the stock exchange lost $14 billion, which equates to $240 billion in today's money. That's in just one day. In total, this crash cost $600 billion in losses in today's money. Banks ran out of money. They ran out of money. So they started defaulting the banks and they were unable to pay other banks that they had borrowed money from. And so money truly ran dry. People just couldn't even afford to eat. Farms all over the US saw their income drop by up to 50%. And again, there was nobody to buy those cars or those houses or anything. Entire factories closed down. The crash did not stop until 1932. And by then, one of every four Americans was out of a job and banks didn't far any better. Half of the US banks went bankrupt, half. The US banking system had collapsed. So almost 100 years later, we no one understand this story. And of course, we can blame the brokers. Maybe we can also decide to blame the 10% of people that decided to gamble their money on stocks. But the whole point of this is we know the story. We knew the story. It's 100 years old. And shouldn't we have learned from it? Isn't aren't there some similarities with what was going on in 2021 compared to what was going on in 1929? Shouldn't it have set up some alarms for us? So let me fast forward a bit almost 100 years, not before I thank Churn Mogul for sponsoring today's video. Now, as you know, our business is not making YouTube videos. We don't really make a lot of money from YouTube. Our company is a fundraising operating system for founders. It's a software as a service and the platform that we've used for years to track our revenue and our conversions and our subscriptions and our cancellations has always been Churn Mogul. Long before they even sponsored this channel, long before we even had a channel. I've seen SaaS companies with millions of dollars in revenue doing this tracking with spreadsheets or not doing it at all, at least not understanding these metrics. And again, I've used ShareMogul for almost 10 years and I can personally vouch for their product. They are the best SaaS tracking platform. They automatically report MRR and ARR and revenue and customer churn rates. You can create your cohort tables and analyze customers' behavior over time or separate them by country or even the marketing campaign that brought them and compare how they behave. It's a truly powerful analytics tool for any SaaS business. And it's free, it's free for any company under $10,000 of MRR. So you can start using it today. You can just sign up with that link in the description. And if you have over $10,000 in subscriptions, you're getting $600 off again by just using the link in the description. Thanks again to the Termogal team for sponsoring a bunch of videos this year. Let's now fast forward a little bit. Let's move to the year 2001, almost a hundred years. We're down by between three and four and a half percent generally across these markets. Let's talk about the speed with which we are watching this market deteriorate. We're red everywhere, essentially down by four or five percent. But we're not here in 2001 because of the dot-com bubble. We already covered that in actually one of our most watched videos in this channel. Please go watch it. It's, it's a great video. Anyway, the world was recovering from the dot-com bubble and people suddenly wanted to invest in something, something that wasn't as risky as these tech stocks, something that wasn't fairy dust. Lo and behold, this very stable, this very tangible asset that we have been sitting on, houses. But who has money to buy an entire house upfront to invest or speculate on a house? Of course not. You need to take out a march, I mean a mortgage, a mortgage. Now, how could I confuse margins with mortgages? Margin trading is very risky. No background checks, a 10x leverage on your money. It's nothing like a mortgage. I am truly half kidding on this one. You'll see why in a sec. The point is a mortgage does require a good credit record. And if you don't pay, well, well, the lender, there's something to respond to it. The lender can take possession of the house, which is a very real, very physical, tangible asset, and they can resell it to collect the money. So for those lending the money, this is kind of like a safe win-win. It's a safe bet. Who doesn't pay their mortgage? But now if- They warn that a recession is right around the corner and the market will crash, vaporizing America's retirement accounts. Here's what you need to know. Economists are pressing the panic button. Harry Dent says we're facing the bubble of all bubbles. He predicts a stock market crash worse than the 2008 crisis. During that time, 401ks became known as 101ks or 201ks. And America lost $10.2 trillion in collective wealth. He's not the only one warning about the inevitable. Wall Street legend Gary Schilling believes the economy is heading into a full-blown recession. As a result, he sees the market plunging by 30%, and that's at the very least. John Hussman, president of the Hussman Investment Trust, believes stock prices are at their peak. He predicts the S&P 500 could crash 65%, erasing a decade of stock market gains. 
In other words, stocks are a bad, very bad gamble right now. The only alternative is to find out how to build wealth without Wall Street. Inside the pages of my new book, you'll discover the asset class that exists outside of Wall Street's control. An asset class that weathers economic storms and still generates outsized returns. Now it's finally accessible by the rest of us. This book shows you how to use it to secure retirement, no matter what happens in the stock market. But you don't want to wait until we're in a full-blown crisis. You'll want to discover the wealth building secrets in this book today. Click the link in the description below to get your copy. Everybody's buying houses. Then the lender needs liquidity. They need more cash to be able to lend more money to customers. So what they can do is they can package all of these mortgages into a pool. Let's say this is a pool of 1,000 mortgages. In this pool, this pool is called a mortgage-backed security. And you can take this pool of mortgages and you can go and sell it to investors. Investors, investment banks. The lender recoups the cash and then the investors get an asset that pays them interest and that is backed by houses, by physical houses and people's mortgages, which is beautiful and safe. Now, this idea was so popular that the investment banks that figured it out and started doing it became huge. And we can go, we can go really deep about this and we've actually done it once again using Monopoly. So it's a much better explainer. But what you need to understand today, what you need to understand is that these investors could trade these securities, these mortgage-backed securities, like stock. They could sell the right for these interests to other investors. And with the extra money, they would have cash to buy more securities, which of course motivated lenders to create more mortgages. The problem was that at some point, there just weren't enough mortgages because everyone, everybody wanted to lend more money and speculate with these things, but there was not enough average people to get a mortgage to buy a house. They already had one. So requirements to get more mortgages got loose, like really loose. And other people wanted it in the action. For example, insurance companies, they began insuring the mortgages, meaning that they would, the insurance would have to pay if people didn't pay their mortgages, but who doesn't pay their mortgage? So this drug spread throughout the US and people were loving real estate from the real estate agent to the realtor, to the lender, to the bank, to the insurance company and everybody else that gets involved in selling a house. Anyway, this bet, this bet that the market would crash would never happen because everything was going great. Nobody was ever not going to pay their mortgage. So you just could keep on betting in this thing. And then others could invest on those bets. Others could profit as long as people paid their mortgages. You could bet things on top of things as long as the underlying thing, which is the mortgage, is safe. But it was, right? So with so much cash available to buy real estate, housing prices started to spike up, just like stocks start spiking up when a lot of people want to buy them. So now you could even refinance this house because it was worth a lot more. Maybe you could get another mortgage to buy another house, a second vacation home. The real estate market in the States went from $1 trillion in 2000 to $50 trillion by mid 2008. This is a cycle of bets on bets on margins on a way that truly the world had not seen before. And they were gambling on people's dreams, on the very, a very real, tangible dream of owning a house, on the assumption that people would always pay. And, and that might have been everybody's intention, but many, many of the loans that these homeowners were getting were a type of loan called a subprime, a subprime loan. That's a loan that has a very low interest rate for a few years. And then after a certain point, that interest rate spikes up. Not everybody understands how this works. People didn't understand this. They just look at how much they have to pay for the first few years. And they didn't care. They can always refinance the house, but the rates were really, really much higher. High enough to make people default. Now this started this domino effect, a domino effect that toppled all the financial institutions in the United States because people weren't paying, they weren't getting new loans, houses became worthless, so banks couldn't even sell the house to collect on the cash. A bunch of these investment banks went out of business in a matter of days. This is the biggest bankruptcy in history, so much so that the US government had to step in to save their economy. And it was all their fault. It was all their fault for speculating, for gambling, and for being 
responsible. But that is, of course, not the end of the story. Things are going to be much worse than anyone anticipates. It's not easy to, to come in and, and move a family out. I pulled up to my apartment and all of my things were outside. It's not just a house. It doesn't just seem fair. I don't know what to do. Nearly a quarter of a million homeowners are in danger of losing their homes. So whose fault was it? I honestly didn't really understand what had really happened in all of these crises until very recently. Dare I say, as we were making this video, but now that I do, I have to say, like, shouldn't have we seen this coming? Like, if history does repeat itself, if we see these cycles of thriving economy followed by downturns and crashes, shouldn't we all have smelled that something was coming after what happened in 2020 and 2021? Bubbles are always uh, hard to uh, ascertain. Uh the uh, originators of it. There really aren't any originators. Everybody got caught in. Some, some were foolish, some were crooked, some were both. But you had a mass uh, illusion that it could go on forever. The problem here is that it's so hard to resist. When Bitcoin doubles its price in weeks, it's just so hard to resist the urge. The urge to take that gamble, especially when we were constantly bombarded, with content from people who took the gamble and won. It's, it's inevitable FOMO. And people have stopped trusting their governments. They have stopped trusting banks. Take all your money, buy Bitcoin. We That's a lie. That is a lie. And they have certainly stopped trusting Wall Street. And at least we have learned that much through this. We can all agree that they carry much of the blame. What we forget is that we, us, we are part of a privileged field. We are the few that can get a grip on futures and margin calls and leverage trading by watching some beautiful stop motion animations from some guy on YouTube. We are a select few that subscribe to this channel, but for so many people, what goes on in the twisted world of finance is just too far off. They are not even close to understanding it. They may still identify with a much simpler story, with the story of this broker from the Bronx that made it big and now does motivational speeches around the world on how to get rich like him. I want you to deal with your problems by becoming rich. That probably means that they're more susceptible to falling for the pyramid schemes or for the get rich fast content that already plagues the internet. Or even worse, they wanted no thing, no part in this world of finance. They didn't want to bet their money, but they still lost half of their pension because somebody invested it in Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme. It may just be money, but it is livelihood, it is education, it is your life savings, it is your retirement, it is your children's future. We are a privileged few who care to watch an, I don't know, 30 minute documentary on this thing. Let's not waste that knowledge anymore. Who is to blame for all of this? If we keep letting this happen, if we keep fueling this just unfounded hypes, then the culprit may be staring right back at us. Thanks a lot for watching.